The big movie star sunglasses were back on her face. Had she been up all night? Had she been ranting again? This had to stop. Violet reached out and patted her improbable friend's hand. What she really wanted to do was slap her hard across her face, dislodge the heavy duty glasses she used as shields and tell Mira to pull herself together. All three of them, Violet, Joshua, Roselle, had taken turns sitting up entire nights with Mira as she smoked and fumed. High as a kite, she told the same stories on repeat. How and why these women's lives had collided was beyond explanation. Each had been an individual planet revolving around the same sun, and each had reconciled themselves to being impacted by the ball of fire in different ways. Then, suddenly, some baffling force of quantum physics had distorted their roots, making their lives collide and entangle. If they hadn't left everything behind to come to Paris, and if Paris hadn't come to a standstill, would their lives have ever fused together like this? Let's not forget that formerly they occupied separate social fields that overlapped only transactionally. Back home, I mean home, indicating different continents, it would be entirely understandable if the four women didn't notice each other's existence, even if they did live in the same building as they did now. No one would blame them. They had nothing in common. In Paris, however, they were all foreign, fighting to fit in. And wasn't that commonality enough? In the quantum realm of itty-bitty things, that was more than enough. The burst pipe, the flood that had followed, had for sure played its part in bringing these women together. Though Dasha could hardly be called a woman, she was still just a child, struggling with her sexuality and abandonment. Dasha continued, just be model, what is the word, mannequin, just be mannequin, as if on cue her mobile ride. The instructor watched gobsmacked as Dasha, instead of switching it off shamefacedly, answered it. He waited till this curious looking Russian finished her call, hurriedly placed her notebook and pen in her bag and rushed out, saying something about a captain call she finally, finally, finally managed to get, how this was going to change her life, and how she didn't need to be here anymore. So goodbye and good luck to all you good people. Before he even had time to process what she had said and translate it into French in his head, the Russian giraffe of a girl was clicking a selfie with her elbow on his shoulder and the rest of the class in the background. Her exit changed the energy of the class as a unit. It was as if a proton had been removed from an atom, making it unstable. Which was the only possible explanation for why Mira... Mira, Mira, please let me speak for myself. Mira said all that she did. And why the Filipinas did what they did. Shamapel Mira. Like Lira, with an N. You know Lira, the non-existent currency? Lira didn't bother to stand up or remove her sunglasses. The rhyme is perfect, as I should no longer exist either. In fact, if I... The instructor interrupted, Êtes-vous marié ou célibataire? The poor man had no way of knowing that a routine question about Lira's marital status would trigger off an interminable monologue. Violet sought out Roselle's eye, and they exchanged a knowing look of panic, both of them now sitting ambulance-ready at the edge of their plastic chairs. Over the last two months, Mira's grief had defied all rationale. She had assumed the role of a Bollywood tragedy queen, out to destroy herself, taking whoever she could down with her, only to prove to everyone watching, except to herself, that... She was truly indestructible. It was barely two weeks ago, while Violet was airing out her studio, that she saw Mira silently swaying upside down, outside of her apartment window. She was so serene and calm that no one on the street noticed a woman suspended from the fifth floor. How long had she been dangling like that? 
Once Violet comprehended what she was seeing, she didn't wait for the lift. She legged it, taking two or three stairs per stride. Roselle walked in seconds after her. Together they gradually pulled up a 500 thread count sheet, wrapped like a lifeline around Mira's ankle. They should have called the Pompeo, the ambulance, or some professional, but instead they went into emergency mode, not stopping to think what would happen if the sheet came undone while holding Nira up. Once Nira was lying safely on the bed with her head resting on the said sheet of salvation, she started laughing hysterically. A genuine guttural laugh that showed no sign of stopping. The other two didn't join in. <laughs> the laughter eventually <laughs> subsided. And she offered an explanation. That only made sense in the world according to Mira. Apparently, after consuming a handful of ineffective painkillers, Mira had bundled herself tightly in a sheet. She had read somewhere the inconsolable babies felt comforting in swaddling cloths because they may make it to the womb. One end of a sheet had still been annoyingly tied to the vertical post of a poor poster bed, where that random Scandinavian lover from the night before a Japanophile and a self-taught master of some erotic spiritual art called Shibari had tied it in an impossible to open knot. As he had been binding her, he said, You're about to lose your ego to serenity at the knife edge of danger. <laughs> The bondage, the sex, his presence had only made her feel more alone and she had shooed away the almost lover before he had even come. Then she'd used the free end of the sheet to wrap herself in it, curled up tightly in a swaddle and waited in fetal position for the promised consolation of not being born yet. While she had no longer been able to tolerate the pain in her heart, she wanted to throw it out of the window where and so since it was inside her chest, logically she had to throw herself out with it. So, in her boozy state, enmeshed in her sheet, she managed to stand up on her four-poster bed next to the south-facing window and had leapt over. The sheet had unraveled around her like something out of an aerial acrobatic act as she plummeted down. Her right foot, however, had got entangled in the sheet while the other had remained firmly tied to her bed. Voila! The pain in her heart had stopped the minute fear, along with its buddy adrenaline, had rushed in. Focused on survival, it beat a thousand times faster and no longer hurt. Some combination of the shibari thing and that swaddling sheet had done the trick. Now, we move forward to when Miss Dasha, who was so busy getting her call from the casting people, has rushed across Paris and we catch her as she's going from casting to casting. Across the Seine, on Khalil Wolf's shop floor on Avenue George Sack, Dasha was holding her head shop in her hand like she was in a prison liner. Casting for the first post-pandemic fashion week was underway, and a makeshift catwalk for the auditions had been created between the chaos of mood boards and hanger rails with numbered clothes. It thought Dasha that the French defended haute couture as art, giving it pride of place in society. It was true that she was desperate to be part of this insular industry, but only to serve a higher personal purpose. High fashion for her could never the art. Art, once experienced, a painting, a monument, or a film, belongs to everyone simultaneously, regardless of ownership. Art can also hold a mirror to your own tedious existence by showing you someone experiencing exactly what you are, making you feel less alone and more connected. Old couture and the realm it inhabits merely outlines the world you can't afford to belong to. For too long, these designers and their minions have weaved a law by being inaccessible and unaffordable. Now, overnight, they have become unnecessary. Fashion is the biggest industry in France. And even if it isn't, it's what separates the pedigree from the players. And every country needs its own royalty. Egalitarianism is a wonderful concept, 
as long as all evolved societies cultivate an unconstrained tier of first among equals. What would France be without envy for the wives and chateaux of Bernard and Antoine Arnaud? Or the generosity of our patrons like the Pinot? An invisible virus may have brought the world to its knees, but it certainly was not going to be allowed to dislodge such noble bastions of privilege. They pay, their paid personnel scrambled around, attempting to erase the last six months and return to normal. This was a uh, normal, where the money were free to fly around the globe in their 12-seater ozone depleters, where they felt superior, even sitting around on uncomfortable benches. As long as it was fun troll, it didn't matter. Ensconced inside packed spaces to watch seemingly androgynous human hangers, sachet up and down runways, exhibiting garments that they would then be obliged to buy for a price that could potentially solve world hunger, a garment they'd wear perhaps once for 57 minutes, and expect to be reposted on social media 57,000 times. <laughs> Today, love this concerned Dasha. She focused on strutting her tush without emotion, just the way Nicola had taught her to. The blander she was, the greater chance she had of being cast. On the phone, he had reminded her to be efficient. The game was to catch as many open and off auditions as she could. If one designer didn't want her, she could say thanks and run to the next. It was a successful system. It left no time to stop and think about how crushing this process was. It's the kind of ugly that uh, works these days, the stylist pleaded with the Lebanese designer. Neither lowered their voice nor took their eyes off Dasha, who was standing in front of them as still as a statue in her heels. Idris, Angelina, Nicole, Penelope, Marion, my dresses are for princesses. Can we please just have an old fashioned beauty, please? Khalil said in his heavily accented English. This is not the time to reinvent a brand. We have to remind my clients how gorgeous they feel in my clothes. I want to get them out of their tracks and bottoms and wrap them in embroidered magic. And I cannot do that if they think they are going to look like E.T. in a dress. <laughs> Dasha has been calling E.T. before, but I never actually seen the film till a few weeks ago. It was an American kid's classic from her parents' communist childhood. And thanks to the ban on Hollywood films, her parents were lip sync all of Raj Kapoor's Hindi songs, but had no idea who Clint Eastwood or Harrison Ford were. During confinement, she and Astrid had cozied up on her single bag, an iPad strategically placed on a pillow, and bore their eyes out as Elliot tried to revive E.T. Dasha had loved the film. And not just because her head had been resting against Astrid's ample breasts, and Astrid's pudgy fingers had been twisting their way through her hair. In fact, she had watched it a few times on her own after. The film was proof that love could transcend the boundaries of country, color, culture, shape, planetary origin, maybe even gender. She couldn't quite see the resemblance. But anyway, she had no objection to being called a lovable alien if it got her the job. I think she's got something, but uh, you're, you're the boss, Callie, the stylist said. And then, seeing the look on her boss's face, called out, Next! Now, where are we? We are back in the immigration office where they're all taking the test. Inside, the course is going on. But outside the building, poor Roselle is having a hard time. She is being made to pay for a little deception that she has done in the past. The mud outside the civics class tasted of her own betrayal. Roselle didn't dare make a sound. She spat out the dirt, wiped her face, stood up and dusted off her clothes. But River Girl, whose real name was Julie, was not done yet. She pushed Roselle down again, sat astride her little body, and started to rub her face in the mud all over again. Where the hell is everybody? The girls of number 36 were supposed to be here. Where is Violet? Roselle could have done with her head right at that moment. And now that she was actually watching Roselle's humiliation, Len, 
in whose name all this was being done, and who had been specially called to seize her moment of revenge, couldn't take it anymore. That's enough, let her go. We're not in kindergarten. Rosel's shame wouldn't allow her to look Len in the eye. It was Len who had discovered that Roselle was being treated like a slave by her employer. She cleaned the apartment next door twice a week, and one day a misplaced delivery had made Len ring the Kuwaiti's doorbell. It had taken a long time for Roselle to answer. She had a light blue Gillette shaver in her hand. And had been shaving the back and the private parts of her employer. Len, who had simply been happy to find another Filipino working in the building, had tried to strike up a conversation. But Roselle had looked at her with eyes that had long lost their light and remained as wet and silent as a stone underwater. From deep inside the apartment, then it heard the Kuwaiti shriek. How long can it take to open the door, you stupid donkey? I'm freezing! Do I have to get dressed and come out? <laughs> Len could see from Roselle's terrified face that this had been a loaded threat. The following week, however, Len waited till she had been sure Roselle was home alone to go knock on the door. Roselle had been too scared to let Len in. But over the course of several months, they had exchanged fast and furious whispers in the doorway. At first, it had been comfort enough to chat in a tag along to a friendly person. Plus, Len had let her use her phone to video call her son in the soul. When the man had started double locking the front door, every time she left the apartment, Roselle had realized the situation was not an exception. And not, sorry, it was an exception, but not a norm. She had wanted out. And with Len's encouragement, a plan had slowly started taking shape. So five months later, runaway Rosette had found herself sleeping on Len's floor. After a few weeks of queuing and begging, the embassy had issued a temporary passport. A new lease of life. Holding this paper had made a delirious freedom she thought she'd never taste again after that Kuwaiti, Corella, looked away her passport. It must have been delirium or the bitter taste of slavery still fresh in her mouth that made Roselle steal Len's wallet and work permit on the eve of Len's big job interview. Roselle's plan was not a very clever one. In fact, it was heavily flawed. She came up with it on the metro after being refused yet another job because she didn't have papers. She sweetly borrowed an unsuspecting student's phone to send Len a message. Posing as the potential employer's husband, she typed that job interview schedule for the next day. It was cancelled because they were moving out of Paris for personal reasons. And the next day, Roselle showed up for the interview as Len. From experience, she knew that to Western people, all Southeast Asian girls looked the same and were interchangeable. Plus, she chose to wear a mask, even though back then only the most cautious people were wearing them. Madame de Cos proved to be skinny, cold, with English that was to the point. She wore an expression of defeat and constipation. Truth be told, with three kids under ten, a dog who needed to be walked come hail or high water, a high-powered communications job at our men's, an irritation of a husband, and a bursting social calendar, it had been months since she'd had time for a full bowel movement. <laughs> After arguing bitterly with her husband for five nights and five days, she'd eventually worn him down, and he had agreed that they could hire a live-in man. So, before the day had been out, and before he'd had the chance to change his mind, she'd set out to find one. Everyone in France, everyone in the world, knew that there were no better domestic workers than the Filipinas. The third one she interviewed said, She would do everything and claim to be a trained nurse and good with dogs. Bingo! <laughs> and obviously she knew what to do with kids. She had an eight-year-old whom she hadn't seen in four years. How could a mother survive such separation? On second thoughts, if someone asked Colette de Cost that question at that very moment, she <laughs> might have admitted that she could do without ever seeing her kids again. She hired Len. Who in reality was Roselle? On the spot. 
told her to move in that weekend, and quietly dreamed of the leisurely poo she was going to have on Monday morning. Now we're back in the uh, immigration office where they have just finished the civics course, finished the exam, and Violet and Nira are walking out of that uh, place. Why were you copying my answers? I was not, replied Violet, suddenly gauging. Why would I copy your answers? It's not like you were listening to what that poor instructor was trying to teach. You don't know anything about how funds work. You've never needed money from the government or filed your own taxes or used free hospital care. When that pipe burst, you didn't even know what the number for emergency was. It's not 911? Asked Nira, surprised at Violet's outburst. No, it's not. And I did not cheat from you, of all people. Mira hadn't been particularly interested in the answer till Violet's guilty as charged defensive response. In fact, Mira hadn't been interested in anything of late. Yet here she was, curious, burning to get to the bottom of whatever Violet was hiding. Curiosity was not a killer, au contraire, it was bringing this cat back to life. She could feel the questions bubbling inside her. Years of professional practice in digging out dirt had taught her that going in directly with a shovel is likely either to splash her mud on your face or break your shovel by hitting a rock. You have to come to it from the sides with an archaeologist's delicate tools, traips around and loosen the soil first. Then, once the tough top layer has been slackened, you push persistently. Gently going deeper and deeper till eventually the earth willingly yields. I'm glad we both passed, Mira said, changing tactics. With my level of French, I thought I wouldn't understand a thing. Your French is getting better by the day, Shelley. Ever since you met me, you've learned to greet and shoo away the French in French. What more could you need? Please, the violet softening and linking her arm with Nira's as they walked out of the immigration office building. Honestly, I don't know what you were doing in Paris for five years before you met me. Exactly what on earth was I doing? Not speaking French and then complaining to everyone that the French don't speak to me, she said. <laughs> they both laughed. Since her daily dose of drama had already been expunged from her system in the civics course, Nira felt calm which allowed Violet to release the tension in her hunched shoulders and exhale. Till the next explosion, anyhow. Except there wasn't going to be another one. Oh. Roselle had rushed off to the metro without saying bye properly. She looked upset. And understandably so. She would have to apply for and sit for this dreaded exam again. She had said something about being on time to cook dinner for the kids and cleaning for the family, or, I mean, clean to the family. Either way, the other two didn't react. I mean, she'd been promising for months to tell her boss. Who, who was now either her lover, or wanting to become her lover, or didn't want her as a lover anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd never built up to it anyway. They weren't even sure if, by boss and lover, she meant the husband or the wife. Roselle often used she instead of he, because in Tagalog they used a gender neutral pronoun, she, so it was a forgivable Filipino mistake. And to confuse matters further, Roselle was the worst raconteur. Unlike Nina, who had an astonishing ability to articulate every emotion she felt and spin it into a spell binding blanket that you wanted to wrap yourself in, Roselle's recounting was like a jigsaw puzzle assembled from different boxes, with missing pieces. They pitched out Roselle and the ridiculous situation she had dug herself into as they aimlessly wandered off to soak in the best part of the day, the time when the temperature had finally fallen to a bearable level. These long summer days had been a revelation to Mira, who came from a country where it was dark at 7.30 p.m. winter or summer. Even nature seemed partial to the West. Paris was having an Indian summer, 
only minus air conditioning. It was excruciating. Houses and buildings had become furnaces. Homes didn't even come with ceiling fans. She found it weird that these Frenchies lived for the heat, while in India, generations sweated away not for a rightful place under the sun, but a respectable one under the direct draft of artificially cooled air. V, what do you like most about France? asked Mira casually. Where was this coming from? And more worryingly, where was it going? By now, Violet knew Mira well enough to know that she only ever asked for another's opinion to serve some greater scheme brewing in her head. Who said I like France? Oh, come on, you moved here when you were sweet 16 or something, and you've lived here for what, 20 years now? No need to give a girl's age away, <laughs> Violet said with a fake laugh, trying to sidestep the trap. I think about how different Mumbai is from Paris sometimes. What I left behind, and who I was there. Do you ever think about going back home to Senegal? Mira was skilled. The question dripped genuine empathy. No, there's nothing back there for me, Violet replied, feeling a lump rising in her throat. Same for me. This is my only home now. Except it will never be home. Violet said this with such finality that they both fell silent. The two walked along, letting their thoughts carry. They aimed to become French at the end of this administrative mountain. Yet, would they ever be considered Parisian? Did this city claim not so extraordinary citizens as its own? What made someone feel at home? The strong, muscled arm of my tall friend Violet linked in mine, thought Nero. This feels like home. I love you, mon ami. Mira hadn't meant to say this, it just fell out of her mouth. I know, said Violet, pressing her friend closer. My mother used to say, home is nothing but two arms holding you tight when you are at your worst. She was full of these nuggets. I miss her, I miss her jiggly arms. I never miss my mother. Why don't you bring your mother here? She died a couple of years after I left, said Violet. Mira was at a loss. How did she not know this? They walked on in awkward silence, thinking about Violet's dead mother in their own ways. Undeterred by mortal events, the day continued to be glorious. I'm sorry about your mother, said Mira piercing through Violet's nostalgia. I didn't know. More silence. How? It doesn't matter. That's a weird answer. Of course it matters. What is your problem today, Nira? Huh? Why are you snooping? Violet snapped, unlinking her arm from Nira's. Well, you know every disgusting detail about my life. I know nothing about yours. You know, that is because you are so full of yourself that there's no space for anyone else to fit in. If the conversation doesn't involve you talking or people talking about you, you switch off. That was not fair. Mira was a good listener. Okay, maybe of late or since the time they had met, which had only been a couple of months, but felt like many lives ago. She had been a bit self-obsessed. Surely they understood why. She had to be allowed this self-centrism. It stopped her from being suicidal. And wasn't she becoming a little more cheerful by the day, huh? Perhaps not cheerful enough. These new women in her life had become her whole world. And it was important to appreciate them if she didn't want them to abandon her. And she most certainly didn't. You're right, V. I'm going to do a better job of being her friend. Violet rolled her eyes. This is a thorny point in my life. I know you know that. It will pass. Then, with as much compassion as Nira could muster, she asked with a smile. Tell me about your mother. What was she like? Just fuck off, Nira! Violet had had
had enough of Meera's bullshit for one day. Of course, she got that Meera was suffering. Weren't they all? She had to stop monopolizing sorrow. The others needed their share too. What did I say, B? Meera was genuinely flummoxed. If you ask me, I'll tell you my mother transferred all her unrealized ambitions on me, making me tremendously talented and driven, till I realized I had no dreams of my own. Oh, la la, I'm crying for you. What a tough life. Oh. How had the conversation soured to this point? All Meera had wanted to know was why Violet felt the need to cheat from a person who hardly spoke French, when she herself was fluent in all things French. She didn't care at all if Violet had cheated. She just wanted to know why. I cannot deal with you and your questions right now, said Violet, walking away. Anyway, I have somewhere to be. Nira stood there, like a bruised apple, by fast. Perhaps Violet was overly sensitive today because it was the that time of the month for her. I mean, Mira's own PMS-related mood swings had become stratospheric with age. Like clockwork, an irritable alien would enter her body the day before her period, its only mission to pull dark clouds over anything sunny. Hang on. Wait, did Violet get periods? Of course she didn't. Mira felt dumb. She had never thought to ask Violet anything about her transition or anything about anything to do with her life. In these last few months, Mira had simply talked and talked, till no unspoken words remained inside her. This was going to change. I mean, starting now. No more vomiting her story into any available ear. The embarrassing episode from earlier that day, she promised herself, was her last. From that moment on, she was going to be as good a listener as she had been a talker. Suddenly, she craved the compassionate cloud of her joint, under whose womb she could listen till there were no more stories left to hear. Hi, she was present mentally and physically without actually having to be present emotionally. She engaged without being invested. It was a comfortable place, a womb. No, 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 no escapes. No hiding behind a happy haze. She was going to listen like her Jani had listened to her. Delighting in every uttered phrase, as if it was an event in itself. Violet was going to get the friend she deserved, a friend who paid attention. Stone cold, sober, not stoned. Nira was going to become the best receptacle for the woes of all the three girls. So she went home, fully ready, alert and waiting for Violet and her stories. Then, she lit a joint. And a wee <laughs> Now, we come to the last bit. So thank you for your patience firstly, especially to the people who are standing. This is the last extract. And this, although it comes later in the book, is the first time it's a story in the afternoon of how these four women met for the first time. They obviously live in the same building but didn't know of each other's existence. That's just the way the Paris life is structured. And at this moment, this afternoon, Dasha is doing an entire photo shoot remotely via her camera and talking to someone on the other end that she has never met. On the afternoon of the flight, her phone was clipped onto a tripod and placed on the landing at the bottom of the fourth floor stairs of number 36. Taking advantage of the un uninhabited corridors, Dasha was in her birthday suit. Playing hide and seek with the beams of light bursting through the stained glass window on that floor staircase. Don't uh, worry, just move freely. We want you some ones where you can see nipple or bush. Benji's voice boomed on the speakerphone. He had no way of knowing that this was his girlfriend Violet's building. He never made it past the ground floor where she lived and he often crashed. Dasha hadn't seen or heard anyone in days. There was no sign of life. No one was in. If they were, they were lost in themselves and their devices. If she died or got sick, how long would it be before anyone found out? How long would it take for her family, the only people she spoke to every day, to sound the alarm? And who would they call? The thought sent a chill on his mind. She was living all alone in this grand, 160-year-old building. Then, and still went through her body. 
And she realized she was running naked all alone to this grand 160 year old building. I think this series should be called The Sun is a Long Tail, but it's still shine. Dasha shouted as she ran up the stairs again. No, no, it is too long. Uh, better title is uh, Be the Light or Be Your Sun. What do you think? I like sun cast. She said, moving in and out of the shadows, turning different parts of her body to the blasting beams that made her solitude seem even stop. Don't move, don't move! Then she screeched excitedly. The light is catching you uh, just right. Uh, turn now to point to your left. Yes, yes, as it uh, Now don't move a muscle. Oh, you are going to love this? It uh, looks like the light is coming out of your, your, uh, you know what? He giggled naughtily like a kid leaping through his father's Playboy collection. Can I move now? Does your gut hurt? Oh, wait, wait, I'm sending it alone. Dasha ran to her phone and squealed with delight. Immaculate conception. That's what we need to call it. The way the sun is shining out of my pussy, it looks like Jesus himself is about to be born. Benji Love. Dasha joined in. They share the same sense of humor. She couldn't wait to meet him IRL. What a laugh they would share. Benji, I love this filter you've used. Will you send me a link for it, please? She asked. Suddenly, she felt something wet under her feet. A gentle cascade was making its way down the stairs. What, uh, what's uh, going on, Benji I, asked. I'm, I'm not sure, she replied. I'm going to investigate. Uh, stop being so dramatic. I, I don't even know where you live. I'm texting you the address, she said rather seriously. Tapping her screens shut, she pulled her dressing gown and ran up. So engrossed was Nira in her reading and postulating that it wasn't till... So engrossed was Nira in her reading and postulating that it wasn't till Dasha was furiously and incessantly ringing her doorbell that she pulled herself out of the cyber well and to notice the water. She ran up the bathroom where the forgotten bathtub was overflowing and the tap was stuck. Running back down, she opened her front door to let her forever present and always unwelcome neighbor in. Together they tried to unplug the tub and turn the water off. To have a tow bar. Of course I don't! Snapped Nira, the undernourished, underdressed girl. As though she were personally responsible for this plumbing disaster. And not a person twisting a towel over a tap trying to help. And even if the apartment had one, do I look like a person who'd know what to do with it or where it is? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. Said Dasha, not sure why she felt obliged to apologize to this hostile lady. Is the guardian downstairs? asked Nira. Uh, not that the guardian, the person who got paid to live on the premises in exchange for its cleanliness and maintenance, was skilled at anything really, except punctually missing the delivery van and muddling up the post. I'm sorry, I haven't heard or seen anyone in the building for days, said Dasha. Let's call the emergency. No! shrieked Nira. And deny a dying person limited life-saving resources that has been stretched to breaking point? Absolutely not. We are going to figure this out ourselves. With that said, she died of them. Nira assumed that the housekeeper, who moved in upstairs a few days ago, would know exactly what to do with a plumbing catastrophe. After all, it was a working class kid. A baffled Roselle, who hadn't fully understood what bring a spanner meant, said, Yes, of course, Madame Malad. I will be down in a minute. Back in Nira's bathroom, three clueless women were now standing with soaked feet, contemplating a tap that refused to stop running. Over the sound of the water, they heard knocking, growing louder like an ominous drum broadcasting doom. Before Violet bursting, Rosette's first thought was whether all women on the side of the building hung around in half-naked 
in silk dressing gowns. In spite of her long, false nails and her dainty demeanour, Violet managed to turn the tap off, tapping into the strength she built hanging off trapeze rings. You have to be the most <coughs> glamorous plumber in the world, Nira said, giving her an unexpected bear hug. Madam, I, I can't clean up here if you tell me where your mop is. I'm Dasha, said the aspiring model, shaking hands with the rest of them. I live on the third floor. I know who you are, said Violet. My boyfriend called to tell me there was a flood in my building and that uh, it would be best not to leave a skinny Russian to fix it. Without missing a beat, Dasha exclaimed, Pantaman is your boyfriend? No way! I'm going to let him say nothing. Oh man, that is fucking crazy. Violet, who was wearing a red lace teddy under her robe and had done her face like Kim Kardashian gone overboard, was amused. I'm Violet, she said. But you, young naked girl, can call me Queen V. She then turned to Roselle. And you are? I'm, I'm Roselle Andal. I live on top, 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 service floor, under, under the roof. I thought your name was Len. But it in Nira. Roselle went pale. She was caught so entirely off guard that she couldn't think of a single lie to cover up the truth she'd accidentally spilled. Madame, please don't tell them. She managed to say, fighting back her tears. Tell who? Asked Nira, not entirely keeping up with what was going on. Madame, and sir, they cost. Madame, please don't tell them. I don't think they care if you choose what you choose to call yourself, said Nira dismissively. So what is it? Len, Roselle, Madonna? Yeah, it's all in them. Someone? Asked Dasha, tracking her. She'd met this cute little button at a casting. She would have remembered. And suddenly, Roselle realized why Dasha looked so familiar. Months ago, on the day of her escape, the first kindness on the harsh streets of Paris had come from this tall girl. Roselle had shown unforeseen courage that day, but it was about time that she did it again. Well, yes, it's a long story. Began Rosa. I, I asked you for direction to. Shall we clean up first here, you know? By which Nira meant Len or Roselle or whoever she was to deal with the flood before launching into the saga of her name. Since it's Sunday, I've cooked biryani. And it's not a dish you eat at all. By which she meant, I invite you all to join me. It was only after the 8 p.m. applause could be heard that they broke up their serendipitous soiree. It was to be the first of many. After all, for months, they would have nowhere to be and no one to see, save each other. 